Last week we looked at the first part of the armour of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and uh, we mainly reflected on the fact that the armour when you're putting it on is actually not just about putting on like a shield or uh, uh, putting on a breastplate and shoes and and the other pieces the belt of truth it's actually putting on a new self the self that has been created in Christ Jesus it's what Christ has done on the cross that when we come to follow him we're putting on a new self do you understand what I mean we're putting on the Christ image on ourselves it's not just putting on about putting on armor and we also were talking about putting on these shoes of the gospel of peace and ended up with looking at the reflection of when we are in trouble is our normal our normal response let's be honest is to hunker down and go protect 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 rather than actually sometimes coming into an evil situation voicing the gospel of peace actually giving somebody who might be causing us trouble to hear about Jesus and maybe we want to say to them do you know Jesus loves you I mean it with all sincerity recognizing that actually it is not normally the people it's the power and principalities behind the person that is causing the grief do you remember that there's lots of nods of heads going on so we're now going to look at the second part of the armor and we're going to look at uh, from verses 16 to 20 thank you to me that's great so therefore then in addition to all of these, so in addition to the breastplate of righteousness, to the belt of truth, and to, the, uh, uh, to have your feet fitted with the shoes of the gospel of peace, in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Notice how I've said my sermon's already been written, yeah? Do I need to preach on that bit now? Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Amen? Okay. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should, says Paul. So back to verse 16, we take up the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming arrows of the devil or the evil one, depending upon your translation. Well, these arrows, what can these be? What can these arrows be? Anybody like to quote what flaming arrows of the evil one can be like? Anybody wanna give us a couple of words, one, two sentences? What can these flaming arrows look like? Doubt. Sometimes we doubt ourselves and, and we sometimes doubt God, but he doesn't uh, give up on us. But doubt is absolutely, yep, thank you. Some thought or bad ideas. Thought and bad ideas, okay, yep. Anybody else? We feel uh, life is at the end, that that's it, the end. Yeah. yeah, it's a feeling of life is at the end, feeling of despondency, yep. Fear. Fear. And you can quite literally be at the receiving end of fiery arrows from other people around you. Yeah. Saying horrible, hateful things to you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, come to you in a moment, Jimmy. Having no faith, no trust in you. Having no? No faith, no trust. No faith, no trust, yep, yeah, thank you. Yeah. The easiness of going. 
The easiness of going with the crowd. The easiness of going with the crowd, yes. A flaming arrow can be one where it's easier to go with the crowd. And actually, that's, yeah, because the devil can do that. Make us feel it's a lot easier to go like that. Okay. And I'm sure there's tons more that you can throw at as well. Our un illnesses and our understanding of illnesses. When trouble comes our way, some of our understanding, you know, the devil can use some of our stuff like that and go, ha ha, gotcha. That can happen as well. So, faith. Well, what is faith? The shield of faith is faith in God. Faith in his promises. His promises to us. Oh no, you never give up. Your love never... F oh, I've now got it. Your love never... F um, we sang that how often this morning? But your love never fails me. Your love never fails us. Yeah? And in the Bible, it's very clear. And you could pull out just about, I don't know how many verses, where God's promises to us and his faithfulness to us is very, very present. Well, what was the imagery that Paul was using? Well, it was the Roman shield. Sort of Roman shield. Please, look, have you ever seen a movie with Romans in it, with the shield like that? If you haven't, could you put your hand up? That's good, because I'm going to then suggest you go and see one. It makes sermons so much easier for imagery, all right? Because I don't have to try and describe it all to you. So that's great. Huh? It's window, film, two... Never played charades, no? Oh, come on, that was good. All right, okay, anyway. The shield. The shield, as we know, would leather on the front. But this is the bit you don't know. It was soaked in water before they went into battle. They would drench their shield in water before they go into battle. Why? Well, the arrow is a flaming arrow because the arrow for the enemy would have been dipped in sort of like a pitch type tar, set light, and yeah? Okay, so if then when you've got your shield up with your mates all next to you and you're in your tortoise and the shield comes down, yeah, flaming arrow hits the thing, hits water and extinguishes. There was no water. Guess what happens? Shield gets set alight pretty quick. What would the soldier then do? Throw the shield in panic, wouldn't you? Come on, get, get your imaginations going. Come on, hold out your shields like this, come on. Okay, shield arms, come on, imagine it. Flaming arrow hits, you've not dipped it in water, right? Ha! Yeah. Ah! yeah? Okay, but then you break open, what then happens? The entire rank, completely exposed. So, shield must be dipped in water. So that's what would happen. And therefore, then nothing will do. And for me, I suppose, I looked at this and I thought, well, maybe actually that water could almost be an image of the promises that God has for us. That faith shield is the faith of the promises for us. And our shield of faith, if, it's, if those promises are soaked in that water, then we are going to be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one, yes? If we believe the promises. But if we don't believe the promises are for us, if they've not become an embedded part of our very being, our shields are very, very dry. So then when that flaming arrow comes, it's going to get through pretty quickly. So we need to take on board those promises that God says, I am with you. And really imbibe it for ourselves, not go, oh, that's for the person next to me. That's why I've got you to eventually start singing to each other, for us. And if you're here and part of Greenford Daptist Church and a born again Christian, guess what? You're included in those promises. And you have to take it on board for yourself. You have to take it on board. You have to literally soak it up. <laughs> Look, you're meant to have liked that one. That just came to me at that moment. 
you're literally meant to soak it up. Like you soak it. Thank you, well done. Yeah, don't bother. Too late now. But you dip the shield in of faith, your shield is soaked. Soak up the promises of God for yourself. Believe them for the truth. Why? Well, we'll come to that now. Why? Because in verse 17, we take the helmet of? Okay. Now, I want us to read this just for a minute. Put on salvation as your helmet. Okay. Take helmet. Okay, helmet. Okay, let's go with the helmet bit. You know, it's the grieve thing with the side bits that come down here that flap. Yeah, it looks a bit like, what's that thing that Sherlock Holmes wear? Like a deer stalker, but it's not. But you know what I mean. All right. So take on the uh, shield and put it on your head. So take shield. Uh, helmet. <laughs> I'm back there. I've soaked myself. Take the helmet. Take. Take. Head. Tie. Helmet of salvation. Let's do that again. The idea is you'll remember this through the week. And tie. Okay. Now, where did you get the helmet from? It was given. It's given. The imagery is taken from Isaiah 59, 17 again, where it makes it very clear that, that, that God comes in with a helmet of salvation to redeem and save uh, Israel, to bring them back. And it's that same imagery. Remember last week we looked at Isaiah 59 and that imagery that God uses and therefore, uh, sorry, Paul uses about God. And we are to uh, take on God's salvation imagery of the warrior, the divine warrior imagery. And it is God's helmet of salvation that we are given by God through Jesus Christ. We are given. Has anybody here ever joined the army? And this is going to be dangerous because I've never asked this question. All right, has everyone ever seen a movie or a documentary where they're taking on new recruits in the army? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, in the forces. What normally tends to happen is, is the first thing that you see, and I was trying to get a clip and I couldn't, it was really, you know, frustrating when you're trying to find something. So you have to go with the description here. Okay, you join the army. You're a civilian. You haven't got a clue. You're clueless. You join up and you enlist in the ranks. Okay, so we'll take this as an imagery. There you go. You're a non-Christian. You then decide to enlist and become a Christian to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. That's quite simple, isn't it? It's about three <coughs> sentence verse. It's almost like signing up an enlistment role. You fill out all the form, then you sign it off, yeah? And then you stand in the right and you get shouted at by like a ma sergeant major or something. You get shouted at, but don't worry about that bit. God doesn't do that bit, I'm glad to say. So then you go in and you go into the army barracks and the first thing you do is hand over, you get receive your new clothing that you're going to be wearing. Your combat fatigues, I suppose. Do you know most of the movies, what gets handed over is the helmet as well and that sits on top of the clothes. You're the new recruit. You haven't earned it yet, but you get given it to say you are now part of army. You get given the helmet. You haven't earned it yet. You haven't even started training yet. But you get given it. Now take that and look at the helmet of salvation. It's exactly the same way. But it's not a shouting sergeant whatever's giving you the helmet. It's a loving God saying, you're saved. That's it. No mucking about. Up to you to put it on every day to make, you know, to remind yourself, but you're saved. I've given you the salvation. That's it. You haven't even earned it yet. Because you don't have to. It was earned for us through Jesus Christ. But you've been given the helmet of salvation. What then happens when you wear that with the rest of the armour is you learn to use it and live in it. Don't you? You learn to use it and live in it. But you've been given in it already as a recruit. You're given it already as a born-again Christian. You're given it already as just a human being who's walked off a civvy street and wanted to learn to know about Jesus and to have that relationship. So, hands out. Grab your helmet. 
all join in. Grab your helmet, put it on your head, and tie it underneath your chin. That is how we come from faith in God in our watery shield down into our salvation that God has done this for us and we train and fight the battle as we go along. And I want to say this and ask this question. So when was the last time you recognised you were saved? When was the last time on your daily basis you recognised you were saved? And in that knowledge gives you the confidence to walk into the battle today. To walk around the whole of the normal life today. When was the last time you just recognised that you are actually saved and we've ultimately won the war? And if your answer is, it's been some time, then you need to soak up the promises of God and work and run with them. And then the next piece. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, some people describe the sword of the spirit as, ah, the real offensive part of the armoury, you know, the thing that comes in on the offensive Yes, but as I said last week, also the shoes that are fitted with the gospel of faith, they also can be offensive. They're offensive as in they are to tread in, you know, you use them to walk the ground, yeah? So they are just as equally offensive. And sometimes even the helmet can be, because when that hell's going on, you just headbutt someone. (laughs) I'm going to headbutt you with Christ's salvation. I was going to be re- trying to... Uh, no, I won't. Leave it on. <laughs> Moving on. <clears throat> but the sword, which is the word of God. Well, it's very simple to go, oh, right, the Bible then. Yes. And something else. More actually primarily when Paul was writing, the Bible didn't exist. Just thought I'd mention that. The Old Testament bit did. But what we now consider the Bible, the Holy Bible, didn't exist. Yeah, the New Testament bit. So the whole lot collated, old and new, didn't exist. I know that sometimes is, you know, it took a few hundred years yet before the... And Anyway. So what is he talking about here? Word of God is actually sort of God's proclaimed word. His gospel of love. His promises to us. His promises through the prophets, then the word, i.e. Jesus Christ in flesh. All of that encompassing is the sword of the spirit. When you take all of that on board into that, wow. So yes, it is. Sorry. So it's that, but it is also this. Sorry, it's not going to get you out of reading this, by the way. It is also this, the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit. We need to know this. Because this is sharper than any double-edged sword, as it says in Hebrews 4.12, which I'm going to get to in a moment. It states very clearly, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our inner thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. The word of God is that sharp. There's also the image in Revelation, isn't it, where uh, Jesus has got the sword coming out of his mouth, the double-edged sword. When God says something's going to happen, it's going to be done, it happens, doesn't it? So, this sword that we are to hang on to, this sword that we are to use is sharp. And it is the spirit that makes it sharp. It's the spirit of God that makes the word sharp. We could all say things to people, but unless the spirit of God is behind it, then it's going to do nothing. It has to be the Spirit of God. It has to, as somebody's testimony stated, which I'm not going to say their name because this is being filmed, but you heard them earlier on. 
It wasn't their words, it was God's words into the situation. And it's the same thing. Ever been in a situation where you're prior to that trying to work out and work out everything you've got to say and how you're going to say it? Had a real situation very recently, I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm talking really recently, spent a week praying with God. By the way, it wasn't to do within church here, it was to do with a situation well and truly outside. And uh, I was praying to God, create the right situation, and I'm trying to work out what's the right way to do an opening line on this. Come on, you know, what are we going to say? Well, God threw that out, did something completely different. Spare of the moment, something else had to come out, and it's changed the situation. I'm not going to go into the details, but, you know, there's times that we can sit there panicking about what to say, and God says, I will give you the words, just keep praying. And, and that sword, in that spirit, changes the atmosphere. And we do need to know this. There are times you're going to need, when the flaming arrows are coming, when you want something to happen, you sometimes need Bible verses to come up in your prayers, don't you? If you know me and you've met with me enough times, I tend to say to you, when's the last time you read this? When you're going through turmoil. Yeah? Yeah? And my brothers and sisters, when you all look at me with that sheepish look, yeah, that says clearly, hang on a minute, let me just scrape the dust off. <laughs> yeah? Without this, and I had to learn the lesson growing as a Christian, here is the word of God. Here is the promises. Here is how he can... <sighs> How he can save. Here is how he can say I can bring comfort and peace. How I can bring offensive remarks that you needs to be heard into the situation. It's here. But if you don't read it, if you don't soak it up, that's going to be your new thing today, soak it up. It's going to rain later. Stand out in it. If you don't soak it up, and that was not a prophetic word, that was the BBC. If you don't soak it up, then how are you going to use it? How's it going to help you and how are you going to use it? It's like food. It's more than food. It's literally, it's God's, what's that? Anyway, it is it. A new recruit in the army gets given a weapon. He, unless he learns how to use it, it's going to be ineffective, isn't it? Give him a gun. Oh, no. Let me see if I can just use the bun end of it to hit somebody. Well, that's a pretty ineffective, isn't it? Especially when it can shoot... Anyway, probably not the greatest imagery for Christians to talk about guns and shooting people. But the point being, this shoots down, this cuts down between spirit, bones, the lot. And if you don't learn how to use it, if you don't keep it sharp, then it's going to be blunt when you need it. That's saying Psalm 119, doesn't it? I meditate on your word day and night. How many of us pick it up at some point? Maybe I meditate on it, Lord, maybe once a week, once a month, or I might dip in every now and again. Day and night. The word of God, sword of the spirit. And then we now come to the most important bit that Paul wishes to sum up in the end, which I really now don't have to dwell on because you've had enough testimonies now about it. But here we go. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. How often are you meant to do it? And... Do you, some occasions you go, that's nah, all right, I know about this one. I've done this plenty of times before. I can work this one through for myself. Who's done that before? I've sold hundreds of cars, thousands of cars. I can sell this one, no problem. I don't need God. Prayer. Paul finishes 
underpins, this is the pinnacle, this is the climax. There is no imagery here for prayer, have you noticed that? There's no relating it to anything else. Prayer's it, folks. This underpins everything else that you're doing. Without prayer, the armour, complete waste of time after a while, pray. That's what Paul is saying here, pray. If we don't listen to God and his commands, everything else is useless. I want to read from you, um, if you could pop that PowerPoint. I want to read from you, this got sent to me this week, which I thought was most appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Um, it's a PowerPoint thing that should come up momentarily, just to show you, and hopefully it will come up. If not, uh, this, these were pinned up. There you go. Morale, how to play your part. This was pinned up in an air raid shelter. Yes, Andy? Thank you very much indeed. In 1940, these were put up in an air raid shelter. Okay, so 1940 here, Second World War, air raid shelter. I don't want to go on. I'll, I'll give you some of the headlines, just for you know. Forget yourself in helping your neighbours. I love this, because this, this is church here. Forget yourself in helping your neighbours. In days of tension, this casts out your own fears and worries. Help them to carry out all instructions about air raids, evacuation, rationing and waste. Keep, oh, actually I'm going to read the whole lot. You got three minutes for this? Keep the moral standards of the nation high. Don't weaken the home front by trying to wrangle something for yourself on the quiet. Make a break with all the personal indulgence selfishness and private wars which undermine national morale and unity. Everyone has his or her part to play in the moral rearmament of the nation. Now I know it's about the nation because obviously this was about supporting already. Be a rumour stopper. Oh, there was a bit of a ripple there. Those who love their country sacrifice the luxury of being the ones to pass on the news. Any patriot shoots a rumour dead on sight. Face the facts, but don't exaggerate them. Prepare to meet them instead. Faith, confidence and cheerfulness are as contagious as fear, depression and grumbling. Anybody starting to recognise some nice underpinnings here? The secret of steadiness and inner strength, and this is the bit I want us to really listen to now, is to listen to God and do what he says. Please understand, these would be pinned up in air raid shelters in 1940 in this country. Could you imagine anything that blunt and obvious now being asked to be pinned up in any air raid shelters? It'd be all, look, let's be a bit liberal about it now and then. Whatever you think, whatever you pray to, whatever atheist views you have, what the da 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 well, Anyway, it's to listen to God and do what he says. God speaks directly to the heart of every man and woman who is prepared to listen and obey. Amen. Write down the thoughts he gives you. Yeah, that's the one thing. So I always say this to people. When God's answered your prayers, who writes a journal down as a reminder? I do. When things are going wrong, yeah, and I've been praying about it, when are God's answers, I write down what's going on and I listen to what God says and I write down what God says. And over the years, you go back over that journal and it helps remind you of the promises of God in your situations. So who puts journals down? If you've not got your hand up, can I suggest you do? Because we're great human beings at forgetting things. Write a journal. Anyway, write down the thoughts he gives you. His voice can be heard wherever you are. In the home, in the factory, in the air raid shelter, in the first aid post, in the college, in the school, in the shops, in your office. I can go on forever, can't I, yeah? Forearm yourself by listening to God first thing every morning. Let's bear in mind, this is going up when there's the threat of bombs, the blitz, yeah? People's lives physically in this country and around the world, I know, at that time, but I'm just talking about here at the moment, were at stake. 
forearm yourself by listening to God first thing every morning. This provides a clear plan for each day and the power to work with other people in complete unity. In a time of listening, God takes away fear and fortifies against uncertainty, hardship or bereavement. He gives foresight and cool judgment. He offers limitless reserves of energy and initiative. I really didn't need to write a sermon this week. I just thought I'd mention it in passing. And this is the last bit. A British general who has fought through two wars said this. Telephone wires may be cut. Wireless stations be destroyed. But no bombardment can stop messages from God coming through if we are willing to receive them. To listen to God and obey him is the highest form of national service for everybody everywhere. I'm going to say this. To listen to God and obey him is the highest form of church service for everybody everywhere. This, by the way, this distribution of this message is sponsored by Councillor A.H. Clark of Mayor of Hove, Sir Cooper Rawson, MP, and Lord Epstein, MP. And it's got the bottom. Pin this up in your home, office, or shelter. If you want a copy of this, please email me. I will forward it on to you. You might want to pin it up in your home, in your office, your shed, men, your garage. That's prayer. First and foremost, listening to God, receiving from him in all situations, in all circumstances. Notice that was every day, every morning. It fortifies you against fear. Yes? Just amazing. Calling on God when we're in a crisis is all well and good, but shutting him out when life is going okay isn't exactly what one would call a relationship. Through the calm and through the storm. We tend to go, through the storm, through the storm, through the storm, but through the calm, you never let go. So I should be with you, even through the calm. Spend every morning with you, through the calm. I also want to note here that Paul links the sword of the spirit and therefore then the spirit empowering the prayer. Notice this, he says, pray in the spirit at all times. The word of God is the spirit. It's the spirit again. It's praying in the spirit. And it's praying in the spirit is not speaking in tongues but it's being actively led by the Spirit. That's the difference. It's praying in the Spirit. As it says in Romans 8, 26, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what he wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. There are times you really do not know what to pray when you're in a situation, do you? Clueless. You're exhausted now. You don't want to keep recounting it because it's sickening to your very mind and your heart to recount what you're going through. There are times that God just says, don't. Just allow the spirit to groan for you. Sit. Allow the spirit to groan for you. Allow him to commune with you. Allow him to communicate with you. Amen? Amen. And of course, there are other times where we have to strategically pray. Pray in, command into a situation God's word. Command that this is no longer going to be the case. Command that God is going to act. But we do, we either decide to do either or all encompassing by listening to the spirit. What is the spirit saying? Pray at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent for all the believers. Our prayers, my brothers and sisters, are not meant to be just about us. Not just about me. So I got that that word had to be changed, you know. Never gives up on us. 
Whereas the church, to pray for each other, yes? Amen? Yes. We're the saints, amen? Yes. So we pray for each other. He says here, very clearly, uh, you know, pray, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So it's not just here, believers who are being persecuted in other countries. Pray for them. Listen to the Spirit. Might want you to do something about it as well. Our prayers are to be persistent and constant so that we do not fall into a spiritual sleep. That's why you're meant to be consistent with it so we don't slumber like you're probably slumbering some of you now because of the sermon. Oh, it's going a bit long, isn't it? Oh, sorry, sorry. We're not meant to lose our fervour for the Lord's work. We're meant to keep going. And this staying alert is also about staying alert because actually stay alert because actually there's a time that the Lord is coming again. Amen? And so therefore be constantly active to recognise that at any point it could come like a thief in the night. We never know when it's going to happen. We've got to be active to engage with those who actually don't know Jesus and don't know the gospel of peace and they need to hear it. Amen? I'm going to ask you a question. It's a bit of a challenging question. When is the last time you invited a neighbour, a friend or whatever to come to Greenford Baptist Church on a normal Sunday morning? When's the last time you actually asked your neighbour, a friend or a colleague to say, do you know, come to church with me. You know, they're going through trouble, you know that. And say, do you know, you might, might come to church one Sunday morning with me. Just a normal Sunday morning. And if the answer is, it's been a long time, ask yourself, why? Because this is the point. Yeah, I, I, yeah, just why? Our neighbours, our family need to hear the gospel, do they not? Well, who are they going to do it through? Us. Do you remember I said about the, the sword, by the way? I forgot to say, the sword is the short sword because it means close combat. It means we've got to be there. We've got to... Chris, could you stand up, please, mate? Just flash your T-shirt. Thanks very much. We've got to... What does it say? Get involved. Cheers, Chris. Got to get involved. Ask them. Say, come to church. It's not that boring, is it, here? Are we embarrassing? I know I am, but don't worry about that. That's a lot minor detail. But it's not embarrassing, is it, being here? We're friendly. We all get along, don't we? Wouldn't you want your friends and family and neighbours to be here? Yes, they might confess and tell people how much you've been sh- they've hurt. Do you know, I didn't know they were a member of this church because I hear them shouting at each other when they're having a go. Do you know, that's all right, that's quite normal, it's all right. Anyway, so pray, praying all the time, stay alert. And note this, this last bit for Paul. Paul's in chains for Jesus Christ, yes? He's locked up, he's not got his freedom. Yeah? Trouble really has come his way for the gospel of Jesus Christ, yes? What does he ask for? He doesn't ask to be released, for prayer to release him. He asks that he speaks boldly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of our prayers, when we're in trouble, say, Lord, please, just remove me from this? Yeah? Yeah, I'm talking to myself just as much. Lord, remove me from this. But Paul's example is no. Pray that I speak boldly for Christ Jesus while I'm still in chains. So next time you're in a dodgy situation, next time you're going through troubles, and... For some of you, it's right here, right now, today. We'd like the trouble to go away, but normally we say, remove me from the trouble, let the trouble keep going on. But God might be saying, no, what I want you to do is speak my words into the trouble so the trouble situation changes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Take a few moments. Listen to God. 
It's what God might have been saying to you this morning. Lord, I want to pray for all of us here this morning in the name of Jesus. That Lord, help us to be soaked in the faith of Jesus. Help us to be soaked in your promises that they become a living reality for each and every one of us. Lord, help us to always recognize that we have been given by you salvation. Give us the helpful imagery of that helmet being tied under our chins, tied to our heads. It can never be removed because of you. Lord, help us be people to understand, to meditate, to to soak up your word so that we can use it as a sword into all and every situations that we come across. To defeat the enemy and the evil one, to help release those who are in bondage who do not know you yet. Help us to be people who bring the gospel of peace. And Lord, I ask that each of us will be people who pray at all times. That actually this body, this church body will be known a place of healing because of the prayers. Be a place known as a place that can cast out demons because of the prayers. Because it is a sincere praying body. A sincere praying army of the Lord Jesus Christ pray that for each and every one of us. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.